Have you noticed that around this Easter time, man, Christians get crazy. We go all out in some ways, and sometimes it might be perceived as more hype than hope. Have you seen a church that gets a little bit hype? So what's the difference between like hype and hope? Like around Easter time, I think there's a good analogy for hype and hope. This is hype. When you are hungry, you go, ah, oh, man, I sure would love to just feast on some peeps. And way too often around the Easter season, we get ready to do some, I don't know, big things. And sometimes the big things are good and we're, we're excited, we're happy. He is risen. But sometimes like we just don't know what to do. So we just, well, just razzle dazzle them. Just give them some sugar coated substance. It's just really nothing. That doesn't satisfy. What if you want like nutrients, bananas though? Drink something that's going to give your body potassium. How about banana? Which one do you want, banana or peeps? Well, they're both yellow. Yellow's nutritious, right? Well, and the peeps are just full of nothing. That's the hype. We want the fruit, like the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. All these things can only come when we have a hope. A hope that's like an anchor for our souls, firm and secure. So, whatever state you came in today, needing hope, wanting hope. May God feed you today. And if all you get is what you gather from a service today or gather from a sermon, you're going to be malnourished. So the hope we have is that God will give you a deep hunger for His Word. Learn in His Word. Read His Word. Let's see what God's Word says about hope. Now, today, hold on. I'm going to hit you with a lot of scripture. When I say hit you, I kind of mean it. So I might have more scriptures in this sermon than any sermon I've ever preached in 20 years of being a pastor. So, ready. You need to go to the bathroom? Go ahead and go now. Because once I get going, there's no stopping. If you're ready, let's start with Psalm 33, 22. May your faithful love rest on us, Lord, for we put our hope in you. Jeremiah 29, 11. You know this verse. It's on your coffee mugs and t-shirts. For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration. Plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Romans 8, 24 through 25. Now in this hope we are saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? But now if we have this hope for what we do see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Hebrews 6, 19, for we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. One more, Unamas, 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because of his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You get one guess and one guess only. What are we going to learn about today? You got it. All right. Don't, don't stop listening now just because you think you got it now. We're just going to continue to unpack verses and verses and scriptures and stories from God's word about this hope of Resurrection Sunday, this Easter Sunday. And what if God blessed us with more hope this Easter? Hope. 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 It's a familiar word, and the more you say it, maybe it just becomes like empty air on your tongue. There's no, there's no ties to really attach it to something. It's just so familiar that it just kind of floats out there. That hope's just floating around. Just... But today, what if today God would make it so abundantly clear and concrete and secure in our lives that we would have more hope? Do you need some more hope? I've got hope, but I could, I, could, I could get it stronger. I could have a more strengthened hope, and I hope that's what God does today as we dig into his word. What if God blessed us with more hope this Easter Sunday? Now, we're a military town, lots of Air Force going on. Those of you that served in any branch of the military, thank you. And maybe you, maybe you were taught this rule of three. The Air, Force has, the Air Force has a rule of three. It says that you cannot survive three weeks without food, three Days without water, three hours without shelter in extreme conditions, three minutes without air, go ahead and test that one, see how long you can hold your breath, or three seconds without hope. If you have no hope, you're dying of despair. 
with no hope. We live in an age where the, the CDC and studies are showing that life expectancy has been on, a, been on a decline really for over a decade now. And it's the first time life expectancy has, has declined for this amount of period, like in over 100 years. We haven't seen such a decline in over a century. And it's not, you know, by like cancer or, or um, COVID or heart disease. Those things, uh, there's getting more help for those things. There's more modern medicine. But what is causing the greater decline Decline in life expectancy is what they call the diseases of despair. Opioid crisis, suicide, alcohol-related liver diseases. These are the, the diseases of despair. We are literally dying without hope. Now, to be real clear and define, what do I mean by hope? What's a, what's a good anchor for us as we understand hope? Well, hope is this. It is to wait with certainty. It is to anticipate with trust. I know this thing is going to happen, so I'm, I'm, I'm hunkered down. I am secure. I am anchored to this, that this will come true. God said it would happen, so I'm believing in his promises to wait with certainty, to anticipate with trust. Hope is not like just wishful thinking. If you use the word hope and wish interchangeably, then something's kind of wrong there. Something's kind of missing. Like you wish on uh, birthday candles. You wish on a star. You throw a lucky penny in the wishing well, and you make those wishes. But how many of you like just wait eagerly for that thing to happen with this deep expectation? It's like it's just a wish. It's just wishful thinking. Maybe we could say it like this. Like how many of you have held a newborn baby or a or, or newborn puppy? Man, my... My old Labrador lass, I remember she had 11 beautiful yellow Labrador puppies, and holding those puppies was so, I mean, just warm, right? Hold a newborn baby, hold a newborn puppy. The one, they don't even have their eyes open, really. And has this ever happened to you, though? You're holding a baby or a puppy, and they latch on and try to nurse off of your knuckle, right? You giggle, that's happened before. I remember holding the puppies. They like latch onto that knuckle and just try their best to get some milk. I'm going, there's no nourishment coming from my knuckle, little puppy. Open your eyes. That is wishful thinking. Now, when we have the wishful thinking version of what we might call hope, wrongly call hope, when we think if I just latch onto this thing long enough, it's going to nurture, it's going to fulfill. No. Those things, those wells run dry, so don't wish on those things anymore. Hope is not just wishful thinking. I hope, you know, and, and we, say, uh, we say this a lot, especially coming out of this, this, or going through still this strange COVID season. Well, I hope things get back to normal. And we say hope kind of question mark. I hope, you know, we're not sure. That's more like the wishful thinking. Another thing, hope is not, hope is not like a semi-patient expectation. Any patient people here? If you raise your hand, your neighbor might elbow you. Like, you're not. We are not a very patient people by nature. But when we talk about hope, we at least think, oh, I'm kind of patient. Hope is not this semi-patient expectation of, I, I expect this to happen, and I expect it to happen on my timeline. It'd be like this. Imagine you're driving. You're stopped at a stoplight. There's one car in front of you. Stoplight turns from red to green. The car in front of you does not go. How long until you honk your horn? Half a second? Two seconds? How many of you would not honk your horn at all? It's like, not a horn honker. Don't want to be offensive. The other extreme of you, like, you start honking and inching forward, going, I'm letting you know I'm coming at you. Get moving. Get off your phone. Quit looking down. Look up. The light's green. Go. We have this expectation of God as well. Hey, God, I hope you're going to do something. And God, if you don't do it by the time that light turns red, because God, I was praying on Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, and if you don't do something by Wednesday, I'm doing my own thing on Thursday. Semi-patient expectations. You go and manufacture your own, like, I'm not lucky. I make my own luck. You'd say the same thing about hope, you action hero. I don't have hope. I make my own hope. Like, come on. That's not the hope that has anything lasting and secure. That's not the hope of the Bible. So when we use this word hope, I want to make sure we're all abundantly clear now. We have the same starting point to go from. Hope is to wait with certainty, a life-changing certainty. It is to anticipate with trust. So we're going to start a hope story. Three hope stories will get there. And we're going to start our hope story. I'll let you decide which garden. 
If God would bless us with more hope this Easter Sunday, do you want to start with the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus asked his disciples, let's go, we need to go pray. Let's go pray in the garden. Or do you want to go to the garden of the empty tomb? This is a choose your own sermon adventure. Which one do we start with? In the garden of prayer or in the garden of empty tomb? Where do we go? Yeah, I think, well, just get to the empty tomb. I can't. I gotta go to the, we gotta go to the grieving prayer first. So we find Christ here in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36 through 39. Jesus has just had the Lord's Supper meal with his disciples and says, let's go out and go pray with me. We read, then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he told his disciples, sit over here while I go over there and pray. And taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here. Stay awake with me. And going further, a little further, he, he fell face down and he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. These words call back in my memory growing up and reading the Bible stories to my young sons as toddlers. And when Samuel was just a toddler, maybe two or three years old, we'd read the books. We'd read Brown Bear, Brown Bear. We'd read all of, all of his favorite books, Ba Chu. And I always wanted to close with a Bible story. So we read through his children's Bible till that cover fell off. And when we would get through the stories and we would get to the story of the cross, we would open that page and it was it has a kind of a red background and it has Christ on the cross. And Samuel could tell that my voice wasn't as chipper as it was when I read the Dr. Seuss books. It was a little, you know, more sorrowful. And I remember opening to the page of the cross in Samuel's children's Bible, and I'm sitting in my lap. He looks up at me in the face, and he goes, No cross, dad, dad. No cross, dad, dad. And so when I hear these words from Christ, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. It's like Christ crying up to Abba Father. Abba Father, Dad, Dad. Is there any way to do this with no cross? Can we redeem and rescue the people that have been set apart because of sin? Can we do it without no cross, Dad, Dad? No cross, Dad, Dad. So from the Garden of Gethsemane, crying out, grieving in pain. He, he sorrowed and troubled. Grieved to the point of death, that's where our story of hope begins. It seems a strange place to start. That's where we see and that's where we go. So from there, we go to the cross. Jesus was arrested and he was on trial. It was a rigged trial. He was an innocent man. He was no sin in his life, but they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Then they crucified him and divided his clothes, casting lots for them to decide what each would get. Now it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription on the charge written against him was, the king of the Jews. And they crucified two criminals with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by were yelling insults or shaking their, their heads and saying, the one who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests with the scribes were mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross so that we may see and believe. And even those who were crucified with him taunted him. And from the cross, they put him in a grave. And for three days, Christ's Disciples ran, they hid, they fled. And for three days, Christ's mama cried. And in those days, no one on earth had any hope of an empty grave. There was no countdown timer going, hey, remember what Jesus said, that he would be betrayed, he would die, but three days later, he would rise. There was no one waiting for three days later. Three days going, okay, now we're going to, you know, like people line up on Black Friday or when the store or the movie or whatever's going to open. They camp out in lawn chairs just waiting for that something that's going to give them whatever seems to be hope. No one had any hope in an empty grave on that Easter Sunday, that first resurrection Sunday. No one is at the tomb, right? The disciples didn't have hope. The only people put at the tomb were there because of the Pharisees who wanted to continue to try to control the situation because their hope was based in their ability to control. 
I said, remember he said he might rise? Post some guards there to make sure that the disciples don't steal his body. So they were there on duty. They weren't there because of hope. No one on earth had any hope in an empty grave. There were days where no one on earth believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the Son of God. Everyone ran. Everyone hid. Everyone fled. Everyone cried. This was some of the most hopeless times in all of history. No one on earth had any hope for an empty grave. But remember, this is a story of hope. So obviously the story does not end there. I want to trace this through three Easter stories that we could see on that first Resurrection Sunday, that first Easter Sunday. Three hope stories. We're going to see the women at the tomb, the women that go to the tomb, and a word for them described is terrified. They were terrified. And then second, we're going to look at Peter, the Apostle Peter. Peter runs to the tomb, and he was amazed. Then we'll also see the disciples walking on the way to Emmaus, and they were opened. Terrified, amazed, opened. I hope that we would see ourselves in these stories today, that we would also have the courage to be terrified, have the humility to be amazed, the vulnerability to be opened. Let's look at these stories. From Luke 24, verses 1 through 6. On that first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in what dazzling clothes? I don't think these are men. They might be angels. So the women were what? They were terrified. They bowed down to the ground. The men asked, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. So we get this incredible picture of women terrified. Women who went to a tomb. Were they seeking the living among the dead or were they seeking the dead among the dead? Well, we can know the answer to that by looking, what do they bring? They brought spices, embalming spices, things to embalm. What do you embalm? Dead things. They were going there to embalm. A, they didn't bring essential oils. Going, oh, here's the ones for, you know, you know we're going to heal him of his headaches. No, no, no. They didn't bring essential oils. They brought burial spices. They were not looking for the living among the living. They were looking for the dead among the dead. Someone who maybe most articulately this, this year phrased this is a, an author and a professor at Wheaton College named Esau Macaulay. Here's a great article. I'll share it in our, our sermon notes. His whole article is amazing. And I wanted to share this paragraph because he articulates this so well. Listen to this. Hope is much harder to come by. The women did not go to the tomb looking for hope. They were searching for a place to grieve. They wanted to be left alone in despair. The terrifying prospect of Easter is that God called these women to return to the same world that crucified Jesus with a very dangerous gift. Hope in the power of God. The unending reservoir of forgiveness and an abundance of love. It would make them seem like fools. Who could believe such a thing? Who could believe such a thing? Anyone in this room? This hope will be terrifying because this hope will send us back out into a world. Very much like the same world that would crucify Christ. A world that is plagued with sins and doubt and anger and racism. A world that is plagued with the sins of the flesh. And we're going to run out there with hope? That world will eat us alive. They will tear us to pieces. Make us seem like fools. Who could believe such a thing? Looking at Mark's account of this, Mark 16, verse 6. Don't be alarmed, he told them, he told the women. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they put him. And then he gives some instructions for the women, those terrified women now called to be obedient. But go tell the disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Think about the angels first, and then we'll talk about Peter. Think about the angels. They've, they've been obedient. They've been ready for commands from God, and they have gone out in multitudes before. 
Right? Remember, remember, remember the, the night when Christ was born, a little town in Bethlehem, and the heavenly hosts fill the skies saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. Glory to God in the highest heaven. Peace on earth to men whom God's favor rests. Remember they were sent in multitude? Now just sent in two. These two may have been part of that multitude originally and going, hey, man, send us in again, God. Put me in, coach. I got to let me get in the game. These two angels had the best job ever. Get all dressed up in their shiny white, wait at the tomb, just wait for it. Here they come. <laughs> here they come. They're going to freak out. He is not here. He is risen. Just imagine being the first ones ever to get to proclaim. He is not here. He is risen. The very first ones to say those words. And we would do well to follow them and echo them. We won't be the first ones to say those words. We will not be the last ones either. Either we want to continue to, to share this great news. He is not here. He is risen. Go tell Peter. Why Peter? Why does Peter get called out by name? Well, think about Peter's life and think about how many times he failed. The, the fail compilation of his life is long. And if anyone ever has any disease of despair, it would be Peter. Or my last words to Jesus were, I won't deny you. And he told him, I'll tell you the truth, Peter. Before that rooster crows, three times you're going to deny me. And he was right because I did. And now I'm deep in despair. So if anyone ever needed a miracle... Want her to do over. Go, now I hope this tomb is empty. I hope he's alive because if this is true, this changes everything. So, Luke 29, running from the tomb, they, the women, reported all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things, but these words seemed like nonsense to them. And they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up, ran to the tomb, and when he stopped to look in, he saw the linen cloth. So he went away amazed at what happened. The women were terrified. Peter was amazed. So if you want Peter's recipe for an amazing Easter, here's four easy steps. One, repent. Because Judas was, a, was an apostle as well. Judas was a disciple close to Jesus. Judas was full of remorse. His failed compilation was too big. He sold out the Savior. He did not repent. In his remorse, he took his own life. Peter's looking for a moment. I need to repent here. I need to ask God to save me, take away this sin that haunts me. Make it right. Make me clean. And from that repentance, then be ready to run. Step two, be ready to run. When you hear the news, have the humility to hike up your robe and run. Peter runs. Step three, be ready to wonder. Be ready to be amazed. I'm afraid we're way too easily sedated in our church life, in our, our search of scriptures, in our families. Just, the familiar, just give me enough. Just enough to be cozy, enough to get by. Don't want to be a you know, fanatic or anything. So we, we, we squash the wonder to a certain degree. I don't want to be amazed because those things might bring me terrified and terrified might cause me to end up doing things that make me look like a fool. But man, God calls us to himself. Then Peter's going to get ready to share a meal. So think about Peter's failures full and how his hope is being filled. He's being filled. He's going to share a meal with Jesus in a little bit. But before that, one more of the hope stories in our three-part hope stories here. Jesus is going to share a walk. So we go to Luke chapter 24. And there's two of the disciples. They're walking to Emmaus. It's about a seven-mile walk. One of the disciples, they didn't even get a name in here. Just He's going to be in Scripture forever known as the other guy. One of them's given a name. His name is Cleopas. Cleopas is the only time in the scriptures we see his name. We can assume that he was part of the 70 that also walked with Jesus. You know, not part of the 12, but part of those that he sent out. Those who heard the words, those who, who walked and saw the miracles, saw the healings. Cleopas, all we know is that his name means a son of a renowned father. It's an arrogant name for a dad to give his kid, right? Cleopas. So when they say your name, they know I'm special. And that's really all we know about these two. So... Now, that same day, two of them were on their way to the village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. 
Together they were discussing everything that had taken place. And while they were discussing and arguing, Jesus himself came near and began to walk along with them, but they were prevented from recognizing him. Fascinating. So seven mile walk, they're discussing, arguing. Are we around people that have a gift of arguing, it seems. There seems to be a lot of things to argue or disagree about these days. And the same as there. They're like, he said he would do this, and I can't believe they did that. And what do you mean you believe that? What do you mean you like? So there's an argument. It's a seven mile, it's gonna be a long walk. Seven miles of arguing about what happened. And Jesus shows up on their walk. He's, he's not allowing them to see who he really is yet. Remember, they were, they were hidden from being able to identify him. And after Jesus asked them, what are you talking about? It's a loaded question, right? Jesus knows, doesn't he? He knows what they're talking about, but he's, he's wanting them to be able to say it. So they say the chief priests and our rulers, they handed Jesus over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. Had hoped. That's the wishful thinking. That's the semi-patient expectations. Their expectations in the right person. Their expectations that he would do the, well, redeem Israel. What he would do is so much bigger than that. What he would do would be to bring peace for those who had sinned, which includes all of us. So it's bigger than just redeeming one nation. It is saving the world from their sin. So they had their expectation in the right person, but their expectation was for him to do a much lesser thing. And they continue, and Jesus lets them know, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I love to go on walks and I love to hear God's word. I would have given anything to have been on this walk. Can you imagine a nice seven mile walk with the teacher? Not just a teacher that learned by reading books. This is the teacher that's been there from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and God created everything. Like Jesus has been there since the beginning, and he's giving them the story, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Not before he calls them out as fools first. Slow of heart. Jesus, those words are offensive. Just speaking truth to them. And they listened, and they, they said, weren't our hearts like stirred up when we were with them? So they continue to walk, and they're going to stop in Emmaus, and Jesus pretends he's going to keep on walking. They go, hey, no, no, come with. It's late. It's dangerous. Come on in. Let's share a meal. And he sits down with the meal with them. Look at Luke 24, verse 30. And it was as they reclined at the table with them that he took the bread, he blessed it, broke it, gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, opened, and then they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. Then they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? What will it take for our eyes to be opened? What will it take for our hearts to be burning within us as we explain the scriptures to one another? This is the hope. In this beautiful hope that Christ brings. Last verse. Who's it from? It's from 1 Peter. Peter writes this. Poor, impetuous Peter, foot in mouth Peter, who speaks before he thinks so often, now that he is, he's seen the risen Savior. Because after Christ disappeared from those two at the meal, they run back to Jerusalem, seven miles, a couple hours worth, get back to Jerusalem. Share, we saw Jesus. He was, he was sharing a meal with us. And then Jesus enters the room and says, peace be with you. You got anything to eat? And Peter, in that moment, gets to see the risen Savior. All hope secure now. So that we would have this verse from from Peter. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Let's pray. Father, we need more of this hope. 
Will you give us that hope firm and secure like an anchor in our hearts? Let us be terrified like the women at the tomb. Let us be amazed like Peter as he saw the empty burial cloths lying there. Let our eyes be opened like the disciples walking with Jesus, hearing the truth. I thank you that you walk with us. Ordinary, unnamed disciples from decades ago, you continue to walk with ordinary people whose names won't be in the Bible, but may our names be written in your book of life, the Lamb's book of life. For those of us that have run after other false hopes, forgive us. For those of us who feel like in we just barely have a little bit of hope. We're hanging on to a small bit of hope. Will you increase that hope? Increase our trust in you. We sing and we celebrate. We know this hope. Let us be bold to share the good news that you are risen. We have that hope that you are risen. We won't be the first to share that good news, but let us not be the last. So on our children, our children's children, let the generational blessing of this hope be true. It's in the hope of Christ we pray.